Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tingser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind to both employees and customers love and support. Thanks to Biz Simply for sponsoring this episode as our show partner. And Biz Simply is the all-in-one HR, workforce management, roads and operations software designed and built by hospitality experts to make every shift run like clockwork. And we join forces to help the industry to find new ways to become even more innovative in how we lead our people, how we operate, to how we grow our businesses, to how we serve our customers. Together, we want to share strategies and tools that can make the industry thrive long term, not just survive. When you are just greenwashing, when you're just trying to tick a box, you get found out. Consumers are now savvy enough to know when businesses are not doing the right thing and they will call you out. You're online. We're living in this digital world. There's a spotlight on you. So corporate social responsibility is not PR. You don't do corporate social responsibility to make the headlines. You do corporate social responsibility because you just want to do better as a business. This is Angeda Waldron. She is a PR expert, author and founder of Serendipity PR and Media in London. She's a multi-award winning public relations professional. She's been named in the Cometrix Top 15 of Women Influencers in PR and Communication and in the Top 100 of the PR Influencer Index. She has over the years been working with brands and organizations to help them build corporate social responsibility into their brands and business strategies. She's also been writing speeches for previous UK prime ministers and ministers. She has recently published her latest book, Corporate Social Responsibility is Not Public Relations, which we will take a deep dive into during this conversation. And we will also unpack the question, how do we put CSR at the heart of our organization? How do we maximize our business results? We also talk about the challenge of today's global pandemic, climate change, rebuilding industries, and how we as companies and individuals really have a unique opportunity to rewrite the playbooks for how we build a better world for the generations to come. So I hope this conversation will inspire you to reflect on what you can do to make a positive dent on the world. Before you tune in, please participate in our survey we are doing together with our partner, Be Simply. Our aim is to understand how leaders in the industry are transforming the organization to deliver the experience both employees and customers are demanding. To say thank you for participating, you will not only get a copy of the final report, but we will also invite you to our launch event. Links in the show notes. But now, please grab coffee, notebook, pen, and let's get started making the world a better place. Welcome to today's episode where we're going to be talking about uh, another thing I'm very passionate about. Actually, how do we create a better world? A world that is good for for the people that live in it, the the communities, and as well, Mother Earth. And uh, when we have to create a better world, we also have to create better business and businesses. And for that, I have a great guest today, which is not only going to be talking about, you know, what is the situation, uh what how do we actually you know find solutions for it but also how can actually businesses get involved in this and even small businesses can make a very big difference and how do we actually start communicating and talking about that because actually that's where it starts where we go from and actually understanding where we are but actually where we have to head to and the actions we need to take and for that uh, please welcome Sangeeta, who has uh, also, I forgot to say that, written an incredible book about this. And actually, that's why we're here today. I read the book and I thought you guys need to hear her thoughts and what she is actually thinking about that. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Michael. I'm delighted to be here and have this conversation with you. So Sangeeta, for people that, you know, don't know who you are, why you wrote this book, your role in PR and climate change. You're thinking, what is that? PR is normally that thing companies does. And what has that to do with climate change, a better world? Can you just keep people like your elevator pitch about a bit about <laughs> how you ended here, writing a book about this, actually practicing that through your work with businesses and uh, what kind of results you're creating? Sure. 
Well, um, my book is called Corporate Social Responsibility is Not Public Relations, and it published uh, this year. And uh, I've been over three decades in public relations, working for some of the biggest brands, biggest global brands, uh, for not-for-profit organisations. And I have seen um, companies not actually always doing the right things when they say they are doing corporate social responsibility or that they are a business leading with purpose and um, so that was my thinking behind the book I wanted to show all kinds of organizations and businesses with a big small new established starting up that it's possible to have a business be profitable and have corporate social responsibility at the heart of its key objectives. So that was the thinking of the book. Um, I've, you know, in 2009, I set up my own PR consultancy called Serendipity PR and Media. And my clients are very eclectic. So I work with, again, startups, food, fashion, books, authors, publishing houses. And, uh, and you know, my mission has always been to do authentic PR, um, always to put uh, storytelling at the heart of the brand and help organizations understand what they want to do. And and the book was just a natural progression for me. But also at the same time, when I started to write the book at the beginning of last year, 2020, the world was already at this tipping point. We were seeing the bushfires in Australia. We had David Attenborough, you know, bringing home to us about this whole thing about plastic pollution. So I just felt, you know, businesses have such an important role in this they are so much part of the fabric of our society they uh, encourage us as consumers uh, they're in you know they're on our high streets they're part of our community so how can you know we get businesses to think differently so that was has been the thinking of the book and I wanted it to be a book that could speak to everyone so I have 15 global interviews with uh, thought leaders business leaders from around the world uh, from Africa to India to the US to Europe, uh, where they share their wisdom and insights about corporate social responsibility and that it does work. Um, and uh, yes, and the book has been, it launched in February and it's been really warmly received. And I think it also showed me that people were hungry for this kind of knowledge uh, and wanted, uh, and it, funny enough, a lot of people um, who've bought the book and read the book, people who have not sort of maybe been aware about uh, corporate social responsibility or being purpose led or about sustainability or any of that kind of stuff. While they've been reading it, they've said, you know what, we know this. We understand this and we want to just now do better, even as the consumer, we want to do better. And so we're going to be making better choices with uh, the kinds of businesses we support. It was interesting. Why why did you end on the title uh, Corporate Social Responsibility? Because it's a bit like, uh, you know, many people have that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's just a, it's a, it's a title on a website and nothing of what you'd say there is actually practiced in it fully. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a plaster, I would call it sometimes for some companies. Exactly for that reason, because corporate social responsibility has to be integrated into the heart of a business, into the heart of the brand. You can't just pay lip service to it. You can't just greenwash. You can't pretend. You can't do that anymore. Why? Because we're living in this digital world. And, um, you know, when you are just greenwashing, when you're just trying to tick a box, you get found out. You know, consumers are now savvy enough to know when businesses are not doing the right thing and they will call you out. And I won't sing it, but it always reminds me of this song. Um, You know, there's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. I can't sing it. But um, that song always comes to mind because now companies, you know, you're online. We're living in this digital world. There's a spotlight on you. So corporate social responsibility is not PR. You don't do corporate social responsibility to <clears throat> make the headlines. You do social responsibility, corporate social responsibility because you just want to do better as a business. And I guess it's a uh, lots of people think will probably think sustainability uh, when we talk about this. But if you had to explain corporate social responsibility as you think it, I know it's much more 
than just thinking about how do you save the the planet is actually going to the root cause of many of the issues why the planet is being damaged as it is oh, s- corporate social responsibility is more than that it's yes it's the planet but it's our whole thinking it's about businesses just doing the right thing and doing better and within that i in the book you know i talk about um diversity and inclusion these are now um aspects that businesses need to have within their culture within their you know within their strategy because consumers want to see more diverse more inclusive companies employees want to be part of something that is making change we've seen last year you know while i said we had this tipping point we also had a lot of these big conversations about black lives matter and it's it's made businesses it's made businesses wake up and look at themselves. Are they diverse? Are they inclusive? Are they representative of the communities they're operating in? Um, and, you know, CSR is very much about the purpose of the business. And right now, I mean, what are we now in um, uh, May? We're still in May. But since the start of this year, there has been survey after survey, data after data showing doesn't matter where you're sitting, Mumbai or, you know, LA, um, wherever you are right now, consumers want to see businesses doing better. And they also want to see CEOs, business leaders, walking their truth and actually doing what the company says. So they actually expect CEOs to be really leading from the front. Um, so it's so you're not just putting a Band-Aid, as you said things and you know in the in the past corporate social responsibility has always been this kind of thing where do you put it you know in, in an organization oh let's just stick it on to hr or should we just put it in the comms team in the communications team where does it sit now it's really leading because businesses understand if they want to uh be sustainable themselves, as in they want to be here tomorrow, they want to be here within the next five years, within the next 10 years, they need to be already sort of stepping up for the next generation of consumers. The next generation of consumers are far more savvy than you and I, and and they, they have high expectations. And where are we then, if you like, should give your, you know, your estimate on the scale where one is that we are not where you know we are not in a very good place as as businesses taking part in solving the the world's problems we lots of people talk about the un goals i also refer to them these are some of the biggest problems we need to solve if you're just supporting one of those goals you're doing incredible good stuff as a company it doesn't have to be climate orientated everything and then 10 we are absolutely brilliant we are working we are moving the needles and the world is getting to a more balanced place as you call it in, in the book as well where are we? I mean, the world is still fighting right now this pandemic, um, and we're not out of it. Uh, but I think what this global pandemic has shown us, A, it's given us all a time to pause and reflect during the last uh, 14, 15 months when different countries have been in different kinds of lockdown. We have seen how the world can be better. Now, as we are stepping back into some kind of normal what i would hope is that we don't we don't become goldfish where we've you know we've forgotten everything that we have just experienced you know where are we at well i mean all this data is showing that companies are really stepping up uh new companies that are coming into being are really thinking about their um their purpose uh the ne- there are a lot of young entrepreneurs coming through right now who don't want to do business in the old-fashioned way and they are really thinking about their supply chain they are thinking about their packaging they're thinking about how they operate their carbon footprint um and are really wholesome you know they they've actually baked in corporate social responsibility at the heart of their brand before they've even started anything else they've really understood their brand and the purpose of it so i would hope that you know, we we move that needle because that needle has been stuck far too long on zero. And we are running out of time. If you look at the data, 
you know, time is running out and we're having the same old conversations again and again and again, you know, about diversity, about inclusiveness. And, you know, it shows that, you know, those companies that are more diverse and inclusive, they are far more creative and they can weather different kinds of storms than those companies that are not. So the proof is there, you know, and and when you are purpose led, you are more profitable because you have customer loyalty, you attract talent, you retain employees. You know, you don't even have to work hard at your PR. You know, your PR is effortless. And I talk a lot about that in the book, that when your um, corporate social responsibility is at the heart of your brand, you don't have to work about, you don't have to work for those media headlines uh, because everyone else is talking about you. It's quite, it is very interesting what you're saying because I absolutely agree because actually it's quite funny in, in the years. I've, I've always been very uh, obsessed about creating great work, you know, a great workplace and being part of companies that does that because I believe that will drive the outcomes we want, whatever the outcomes are. Uh, because if we're focusing on that and also actually focusing on giving a bit back to our communities and actually thinking about what our wider impact is when we do things in the business from a planet point of view. We we touch those three areas and then we have an intent to be better 1% every day instead of like all this craziness, right? Small things we do, if it's like reducing energy consumption in our kitchen, with that it's a comfort hospitality industry, that's what been my focus, or how can we actually just make sure that people feel a bit more safe in their jobs, or so whatever it is, you're actually improving the planet. It has a ripple effect, but you need to be consistent in it. And I think that's the thing, but also you need to stop focusing on the 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 fina- financial outcomes all the time. They will come automatically by doing the right thing but the right thing is hard and i think that's why we sometimes it's easier to skip over to the other side where you don't focusing on these things because it's hard to do the right thing i mean just as you're talking there's so many things flying through my mind one is you know nothing is easy you have to work hard at success you know um and when you when you do the right thing yes the rewards will come And it will be far more sustainable and enduring than doing the quick fixes. Quick fixes means you're, you know, you're not, you're not doing the right thing by your employees, by the community you're operating in, the 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 goods you're selling. You know, you're you're doing all these shortcuts, and that will sort of come back at you. Uh, The other, I mean, another great example of this when you were talking, I was thinking about we just had in this country and around Europe, this whole conversation about the Super League, which was just driven by greed. It was greed. And this is the first time this country has been united in that four days that we had that, you know, it was on the high on the national agenda, on all the news, and people came together and said no. And, you know, the Super League kind of dispelled and it it's gone. But now there is this thinking of how to protect football so it doesn't happen, that these kind of things don't happen again. And I think that's just a great example of what you were talking about, greed. It doesn't work, you know. And it's, again, it just shows people want different, people want better. And as consumers, give us better. You know, it's up to businesses to give consumers better choices and us as consumers to demand better from businesses. So it's a two-way relationship. Yeah, and that's super interesting because how do you then take, you know, you've written this book and it, it comes from a very deep place. How do you take those things that you say you work in PR and you're thinking, how how the hell did Sengita actually take that into her work and how does she actually make that part of the PR company she, she's running? Because I guess there's reality, there's, there's a job to be done as well. And where where's the connection, and how are you using it with your with your clients? I guess they seek you because they also are hungry for this in kind some kind of way, and they don't know hundred percent what to do. Yeah, and I mean, you've read the book, and anyone that would have read the book will see that there's nothing complicated in this. There's no rocket science. It's just about it's stripping things back, and I believe in things being very simple and easy. So um, it's finding out. So how do you do it for yourself as a business? Well, if you're a new business, or even if you're an established business, it's really understanding the purpose of your business. So go back to your brand, go back to your story, 
Why did you set up? So what, what are you trying to do? Also understand who your customer is. I know so many businesses who are established or about to launch, they don't know who they're communicating with. They don't know who their customer is. It's having that engagement with your customer. And customer now, that term customer has become so important, especially during this pandemic, um, because people want to believe in something and buy from a brand that is delivering good in some way. So it's not about changing the world, but if you are producing, I don't know, a cake, you're you're a, a cake business, that you're ensuring all your ingredients are, you know, are clean, you know, it's just healthy. You know, whatever you're doing, you're doing with purpose and it's a great end product. So that means you can talk about that product to your customers and your customers can engage with you about that product and ask you. And you're not going to be lying about anything. You're you're going to be honest. It's about authentic, creating authentic brands. And that's where PR helps. You know, that's where PR um, comes into its, its own there. But public relations is not corporate social responsibility. Everything first starts with CSR. It doesn't start with PR. It's not about, okay, we're just going to make this cake, make it look great, don't care what's in it, and then we're going to just bang it out and sell it. That's It never works that way. You know, you, you might create a little bit of traction, but it doesn't endure. So how do you create strong brands that live and um And, you know, there is a way to do that. And that is about having purpose at the heart of your brand by doing good, whether it's with your supply chain. And just on that, I read now recently, um, 60% of companies now around the world will ditch their supplier if they don't think their supplier is ethical or sustainable. And they're ready to do that now. Whereas before, people probably turned a blind eye. Now they're really looking at their supply chain because all that affects your brand. All that affects the relationship with your with your customer, with your consumer. And what we're also finding is because bra- there are so many new brands coming up as well that are so purposeful, they are talking to a particular consumer. Not everyone will want to buy from you, um, but the right person will buy from you because they buy from you because of your purpose, because of your story. It is so interesting. Um, also, because I, I have a couple of other businesses I'm involved in, and one of the, all of them, they've actually started with the purpose. Even Hospitality Maverick started with the purpose, wanted to make the industry better, wanted to make it better in all the, the ways it could become. And actually, that that drives everything we do in a way. And then, of course, there's a also a reality that we need to make business but in a way that we we have also been very aware about how we choose customers now because we have spent a lot we spend the pandemic understanding our avatars and actually understanding where we felt best and where we gave most value we actually give most value to the people that wants to do the right thing because we our solutions are built around doing the right thing and i think that's what you see with many many founders when you meet them they are. They want to do the right thing because, but, but maybe what they need, or what the reality is, they just need some help scaling that story, the purpose, and that could be true. You know, a commercial vehicle. It could be through a nonprofit, but actually they need a bit of help, and that's where the wisdom comes in for people that maybe have experience to actually help them scale that purpose in a way and then that's the storytelling but also the product how you do all the right things how do you make it commercial viable because there's a rela- if you don't make profit you can't live your purpose so it has to balance those two things absolutely and also know as a business what are you actually offering what is your service what is your your you know what are you selling what is the the offer that you're giving uh, to people, what's your solution if it is a solution based uh, business? I come across so many different organizations, so many different businesses who don't know what they're offering, who don't even know what their brand story is. And then they wonder, you know, they've they've launched, they've kind of done a little bit of business, but now they've they've stalled. And so what some and what you do find is because their competitors are doing really well, they've just copied their competitor from everything, from branding, from look and feel and so you know I say to them so how does your customer know that 
you know, you're different. You know, what is your offering? Why are you better than your competitor? There's no point having your website looking and feeling like your competitor. When anyone lands on your website, they probably think that, you know, they're they're somewhere else because you have you haven't differentiated yourself within the marketplace. So yeah, I mean there this I could talk about this forever, but there's so many, you know, I see come across so many businesses that haven't got their ducks in a row. You know, and it all just starts with the so what what is your business about? What's your passion? What's the purpose? And what are you offering? And then when you've kind of worked out those four key things, you then understand who your customer is um, and you have that that relationship that communication with your customer and also just I was going to say the other key thing is you then know if you do want to look at PR and media you know a campaign where you want to be seen do you know where is where are your customers reading what are they reading where are they hanging out because you know everyone says oh we want to be in the times or we want to be in the Guardian, but are your customers really reading the Times, or are they reading something else? And they go, yeah, actually, they're not reading the Times. It's just their aspiration. So it's really breaking it all down. I think it's really interesting. You talk about these avatars, and I often, when I talk with people, I talk there's avatars. There's so your customer avatars, and there's your employee avatar because you want to attract a certain type of employees. No, no, I want everyone. No, you know, your culture is not for everyone. You need to be a strange culture because that's the work we do. But also we understand you need to understand your customer avatar because else you're not making any money because that's actually the, the biggest failure many businesses do. And this is the hardest work to stay at and actually continue because I'm part of a project right now where we really now for six months have been trying to understand it avatar and we are not there yet. And it frustrates the hell out of us because we're using all the the methods, you know, all the, but it's just part of the process. We haven't found the tribe and we just have to continue. There's no reason to launch big before we get that done and nailed that. So uh, the interesting thing is when I meet operators or business owners, I can only confirm what you say when I ask them. So who is your customer? And then they say, oh, well, they are young professionals. They earn so and so much. And they go out on a Friday and a Saturday. That's this maybe a big brush kind of thing. And that's the problem. They should, you should go down totally to know the name is. They come from this and this background. They read these, these books. They're passionate about these things. And sometimes they do that. And at four o'clock, they do this. And in the morning, they will probably do this. And that's where you actually can start to communicate relevant to them as well. And actually, you know, really start to change their life. And when you're part of changing their life, they will become loyal customers forever. It's the good old fashioned shopkeeper, do you know, who would know their customer. My, um, when I was growing up, my mum used to have a shop here in London and her customers, she knew her customers and they would come in. I mean, she would never close on time because they would always be in, in the shop just chatting. But she knew their life story. And it was a wool shop. And so she knew what wool they like to knit with, what colours, what they've knitted last, you know, last year. So and whether if they had grandchildren, if they had, you know, so would they be knitting now for, you know, for the next generation? So she she knew all that. And she had that relationship. That was by that conversation. And it's just that good old fashioned conversation, you know, and that creates community. And, um, you know, when my mum first uh, bought that shop, um, people came and told her that they wouldn't come and shop because she was she wasn't white and uh, she was she was Indian. And um, that made her more determined. And when she finally closed, you know, she was selling the shop. They didn't want her to go. And, you know, because she created that relationship. Uh, within that community and that comes back you know it's just everything you've just said it's everything that's in the in the book it's about how do you have value and how do you um, so corporate social responsibility is the values you know that you operate your business by it's your decisions and activities within your local community whether you're a small business and then those implications on the wider society and then on the environment and it's it's very simple. It's not as you know, it's nothing complicated. But it's exactly what you've just said. 
you know, just knowing how you want to communicate and who you're communicating with. Yeah, and also uh, a mentor of me said to me, he is uh, way wiser than me. He's in his 17. Chris, he said to me, Michael, you just need to be patient right now with the things you're working on. Uh, and I started working with Chris three years ago. And it took me a very long time because I'm very, I'm, I'm very driven. And actually, I had to understand. I actually has to stop up and actually spend more time understanding than just creating. And that's extremely hard for somebody who runs their own business because actually that's actually where the goal is. And he's absolutely right. I see I'm harvesting the fruit of it. There's no doubt about that. But it took me a very long time as well. Be patient. Stay at the idea sometimes and your purpose to understand how you can actually inspire other people to be part of, of the journey you're trying to create with your business. Um, and, and actually, it, it leads me to something very interesting because we already talked about, you know, businesses can be part of changing the world. Why you talk about in this book, it is a part of it where you talk about this, this tipping point in the world. The pandemic has almost been talked about as a, a tipping point because we're all in it, you know. And, you know, you had the uh, Black Lives Matters coming out of this and you talked about Super League, a bit more innocent kind of thing. But it's just interesting. There's these events happening where you just see people come towards thing in a very different way. What is the tipping point and where, where, how do you define that? We're in a tipping point right now. We are, you know, we've just come out of here in the UK, we've come out of a, a very long uh, life under lockdown. And it's now how do we go forward and how do we create the change that we want to see? That is our tipping point here. Right now, we're seeing a tipping point in India with what's going on with the with the uh, coronavirus. We saw a tipping point in America uh, last year during the presidential elections. Um, right now, the world is also at a tipping point with how does it actually join up to uh, deal with this pandemic? Because we have... What this pandemic has shown us is that we cannot do this alone. We are all connected, you know. So right now, if India is, uh, you know, dealing with a with a second wave, then it'll become our third wave, you know. So we're tipping points right now. Seem to be here with us all around the world. We're all dealing with different kinds of tipping points. Um, the world itself is at a tipping point. Because we are seeing, we're not, we haven't even sort of, they say we're not going to um, meet the sustainable development goals. You know, we're way behind that. That's a tipping point. So how do we create all these changes to just move the needle somewhere that we're still not back where we started 10 years ago? We've done, we've made vast changes um, with this digital world we're now living in that's here to stay you know 10 years ago we couldn't think of communicating like we are right now that's been a tipping point you know tipping points are happening i believe all the time um it's just how do we decide where we want to go next um how do we want to break and make change you know a lot of us right now what i thought was a sad um state of affairs is when we were coming out of this pandemic here in the UK two weeks ago we saw queues outside Primark people queuing round the block to go into a fast fashion uh, company when we've had this time to reflect and pause I thought somehow we would be a little better than than that a um, little better than Primark because Primark, all it's doing is creating fast fashion that goes into landfill. You know, we haven't. So I, I was surprised. I expected better. But where I have seen better come out of this is with businesses. Businesses have really th rethought how they are doing business, how they want to do business in the future. Superdrug, which is a, a big um high street pharmaceutical it's a drugstore they have brought out their first corporate social responsibility report we are seeing more organizations looking at their well-being of their employees the well-being is also part of your corporate social responsibility it's part of your community so businesses are doing really well but somehow we as individuals we are we're not 
that's just my observation. Um, I, something has been missed. You know, somehow we haven't all moved that me that sort of that needle point within us. And I guess also because even though they say lots of habits have changed, they're still. It's you know we we come from decades of this you know growth paradigm where we have to grow 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 we have to have more 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 things um uh, buying things make us feel happy or that's definitely what business and commercials wanted to us to believe at some point and I think that's definitely changing uh, also just I can feel that change uh, within myself. I had that for years, but like lots of people around me that normally would, you know, I need a new kitchen. I need a, no, no, it doesn't matter. It actually does the job. Like, uh, is there a way we can recycle things when we have to change them or can we buy used things and stuff like that? And I, I guess there is a movement, but it, it is so, you know, it's become such a way of our life that it's difficult because we are, we are and it is funny, we just use it. We are hungering to come back to that. That 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 you know you know it's not really it's not really important. It's like these physical things we're hungering to come back and do them. Um, one of the things I've been hungering was that come out meet my pe- people I know and have a meal with them. That's what I'm hungering for more than uh, all the, the, the buying things again. But it's, it's so interesting to see, and I've seen the same around when I live, where people have queued up for things. Where I thought, would you really queue up for that? after all this is that what you want to spend your time on but it's so interesting so yeah you're right there's maybe a movement going on but it's maybe not shifted as much as we thought it would yeah and also i before the pandemic happened in 2019 i went to go and speak to an inner city school here in london and um i came away thinking that being aware being ethical wanting to buy local all that kind of that thinking is very much a middle class value because i can afford to do it i have those choices i can make those choices when you're um from a poorer vulnerable uh family you don't have you can't make those choices you know you, those choices are made for you because if you want to buy plastic free it's more expensive that's why i think we as consumers should be demanding better and businesses should be giving us better and it should be affordable for all you know so if you want to buy loose apples or loose carrots you shouldn't be paying for the the privilege of doing that um and i think that's that's where you know that cha- and then people will that change will come automatically you know in the book i have a chapter on india and now India, you know, it's it's been called one of those tiger emerging economies, which is great, but there's been a downside to that. And the downside is globalization, where you now have McDonald's, Burger King, all these kinds of big corporates operating in there. So what India was known for, which is its heritage, its cottage industries, they've been pushed down. And, you know, people... You know, you have the greengrocers still very active in small towns in India, but a lot, you know, you see creeping in um, plastic wrapped food, you know, um, apples in packaging, whereas before you used to buy your apples loose, you know, you buy what you needed. And it didn't matter whether you're rich or poor, you could all, you know, you could afford to spend that. Um, You made your, your choices. Uh, those choices seem to, I think here in the West, we've lost some of that choices because the nice, good things for us are more expensive. How does that work? You know, the good things for us, for our body, for our healing, our well-being are more expensive. And, uh, you know, a good food should be, you know, uh, uh, something that is available for anyone, no matter financial status, because that was something, you know, even, you know, we would go 50 years back. That was something that was available to everyone. There was not something that that was something you bought to. So food has now become this uh, commodity in, in a way, and that's where it becomes very dangerous. But food choices, as I normally say, and that's the interesting thing as a consumer, that's where you can make a choice three times a day because you eat three times a day, and you can vote with those food dollars in a such a significant way um, what you do with them. And uh, and I think that's the key thing where the people that can afford to vote with their food dollars. And I think also healthy food has become um, 
is it become a very privileged thing so it's become something for the middle class and the, the super wealthy they can do and i think that's one of the things you know if a government should crack anything is that because it will solve many other issues health issues financial issues and so on and so on if people eat just better food yeah and i mean there's so much again there's so much data so much science every other day we're reading that you know what we put in our bodies also affects our mental health you know and and when we have optimum mental health we we just operate better the economy is better we're putting less pressure on on uh, the nhs on our frontline workers so it there is you know and it comes back to just you know businesses uh supermarkets doing the right thing doing better you know it comes back to their values their purpose and and a lot of these supermarkets actually you know during this pandemic have been doing the right thing really stepped up you know in the beginning of this pandemic we saw supermarkets doing better than the government in delivery of certain things you know the way they they pivoted they were able to get going they the way they operated um protected their their frontline workers working within the supermarkets they got it right and you know we could still see government stuttering you know not being able to keep up and not not pivoting quick enough so um i think that you know when you when you talk about the tipping point, I've seen a tipping point within businesses. Um, I globally, businesses are waking up to the fact that they need to be better. That there are consumers wanting better from businesses and demanding it, and not afraid to shout out about it. And therefore, you can't just greenwash your way uh, into the market. As small businesses or large businesses, who should we be looking at to get inspired from businesses that really? have this, you know, the, the 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 CSR incorporated in everything they do and they move the needle every day. Is there anyone where you say, okay, well that that's like, you know, nobody's perfect, but they are definitely, you know, pushing the 80% of the way. Um, I like Brewdog. So they're a craft beer that they were set up in 2007, but everything they do is with purpose. During the pandemic, they stopped making their craft beer and created, they started making hand sanitizer. So they they really understood what the value, you know, that's what was needed from the local community. I I love BrewDog and what they do. Um, Lush Cosmetics, um, they they call themselves a a campaigning cosmetic brand. Uh, So campaigning is the heart of their brand. Everything they do is about um, making a statement, you know, an ethical, sustainable statement. Uh, body shop has been you know it's been on our high street for for a very long time while it's now owned by l'oreal and you know anita roddick so sold it to l'oreal they've been at the forefront uh, you know i remember in the in the uh 80s 90s you could take your bottles back to be recycled or to be refilled so they were doing a lot of the things that we've come 360 degrees now and you know we, we're asking um supermarkets to do Body Shop is a great example. Ben and Jerry's ice cream is is another. There are so many brands uh, that are doing well and have got it right and who inspire me every day. And it's not about doing all the big things. It's just doing one thing. You know, if you're a business on the high street, if you can do one thing, and that might be, you know, you're looking at the goods you're stocking in your shop. What's there? You know, what is there? footprint you know where has your supplier sourced those handbags from um if you're eating whatever you're buying from your your local sandwich shop do you know what's gone into your sandwich just those simple things as the consumer we need to be more purposeful and as the business too you know we need to be more purposeful so we're we're all working for the same thing which is the, you know, this planet that we're all living and breathing and living on. It's interesting you say supply chains, that the most CEOs and that's, that's really into this and, and, and in the food industry understand actually it's not about a campaign talking about all the small things we can do for the consumers. Uh, he said it's great we can have recyclable packaging and all that, but actually our biggest job is in our supply chain. And that's where we're going to have the biggest impact if we sort that out because that's the most untransparent bit 
of the whole thing, food and, and the impact of the world. And it's so interesting that some of them are starting finding out that and actually finding out this is a, a difficult journey because it's also its business relationship, its supply chain of what you need to produce to, to make money. So actually going back now and actually challenging that supply chain is where you can make the significant change, the invisible stuff in principle. What you don't see from a, a carrot coming out of the ground to it lands on the plate in a restaurant or in your supermarket. And I think that's interesting that we're actually starting to hear CEOs starting looking backwards and say, okay, that's where I need to spend my focus and my time because that's where I gain the most impact. Um, and all the other things are great, but they really don't move the needle because they're just covering up the really big issue is where things are coming from and how they are grown, how they are, people are treated, they grow that and, and so on and so on. Absolutely. And, you know, that's when uh, CEOs are leading from the front. And that's where, you know, consumers want them to be. They want them to understand how they're producing their products. And it goes, it's not just the carrot that's on our plate, but also what tears and blood have gone into that top, you know, that shirt you're wearing, the t shirt you're buying, you know, that's really important, because, you know, while things might, they might say stamp organic cotton, You know, is it some child who's gone and picked that cotton for you, for your T-shirt? Is it a 16-year-old pregnant young girl who's been denied an education? Or, you know, they are sort of, there are these slave trades on uh, cotton plants, on these cotton plant uh, farms. So fashion also now is really looking at the, the supply chain and they're using technology for that. Uh, and that's that's one of the uh, positives um, from this is really looking at um, using data to see where things are coming from and what has been the blood, sweat and tears. And somebody said this to me recently, and it really made me think, you know, because am I wearing something that somebody has actually, you know, sweated and, you know, lost their own freedom? for me to wear something uh so yes it's really looking at everything you made me reflect and think about where's my shirt from actually uh and what's gone into that that's really a good question again because it's all our supply chains you know food and clothes is probably some of the biggest supply chains in the world and i know yeah and also you know when you don't use the clothes anymore how can you make sure it gets a second life or can it be recycled in, in some kind of way it's also those things you know because we've just gone through a, a whole lot we have small kids so we, we have gone through all this clothes we inherit and now we, we we've been giving it away to, to charities and some of it couldn't be given away and then we found way we had to go out of our way actually to recycle which i thought was crazy i thought there must be a place where you can put clothes for recycling everywhere it's not easy. And again, just shows that the infrastructure, when we talk about supply chain, it's not there. But what? let's let's move, in, move it a bit on again, because what do you think? You said that we are behind the goals we need to behind. How is this CSR, CSR looking as we uh, go forward? What is the future for this? What will happen in the next five years when we are at the tipping point? How do you be, or how do you wish maybe, we should say, you think that businesses are working with this in five years time is that a like a, a you know if you don't do this you'll probably be very close to be extinct is that what you think we all will be <laughs> you know we'll all be extinct but i think you know i you know csr has really moved before you know i'm talking about 15 years ago csr you know i think i started by saying was kind of like the band-aid no one knew where to put it it didn't even have a budget now csr is leading uh, within businesses it's at the, the forefront of the purpose of a business it's within the the business strategy of a business because they're looking at supply chains they're looking at their products they look you know how they're manufacturing what's the carbon footprint they're all these things so cs corporate social responsibility is not a flash in the pan it's not tr- on trend uh and why why do i say that because the next generation of consumers want better uh, they want better from businesses. They want better for themselves. They want better for the planet, um, and they, they are looking. And they don't. They don't want to work for um, organisations that don't have uh, a purpose and that are not doing the right thing. That's basically what it is. That are not doing the right thing. 
And will those businesses be extinct? Yeah, because A, they're not going to have the customers. B, um, you know, they uh, their brand won't uh, endure. And uh, they're not going to be able to attract the talent uh, of people to come and work with them. And, uh, you know, corporate social responsibility, being a purpose-led business means you can be profitable. And um, without it, and I would, it's not just a hope, I believe without it, you're not going to endure, you will be extinct. And what this, uh, uh, also very quickly, what I want to say is, you know, Harvard Business Review um, must be 10 years ago now, did this, um, did some research, and they said those organisations that are not online, don't have any kind of digital uh, uh, footprint, will be extinct. What this pandemic has shown us is that organisations that have not had any kind of social media activity profile have really suffered because they've not been able to engage with their consumers or their clients. In the same way, CSR is not going to go away. It's 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 very much it's part of technology. Technology is proving uh, it's it's a friend to corporate social responsibility. It's, sh- it's showing how things are made. It's it's also putting the it's empowering consumers to call out bad businesses. So I I, I do think this digital world that we're living in, we're not going to go back to ink and pen. We're going to continue in this digital transformation. That will that is going to really shift uh, corporate social responsibility. It's going to take us forward leaps and bounds. Great, great. And I, I agree with you. And I think it actually comes back to when I talk to people about it's just about, you know, these businesses that's done this for maybe 20, 30 years. You mentioned Ben and Jerry. I love a company called Singerman in the US. They've done it for 30 years. And they're not just doing, they're not just purpose led. They're also great businesses. They are very profitable, but it's how they use their profit to actually move on and, and have a role in society. And they feel they have a real role to play. And funny enough, they're also great places to work and therefore their competitiveness, no matter what hit them. And funny enough, in the pandemic, these some of these businesses, because we spend a lot of time looking at what does great businesses inside and outside hospitality do? And they start with purpose, building a great place to work, uh, taking care of the customers, the communities, and then the planet, and then the rest will follow. And they, and they, funny enough, they uh, they have just been consistent over the years, no matter what have hit the world. And even in the pandemic now, I'm, uh, and I, we don't have all the results yet, but you can still see these company thriving within this because they have they don't have the same problems as the, you know, faceless organizations, as I call them, that the, the people that haven't chosen to be great, as I would normally call they have chosen to be Medicore. They haven't chosen, made a choice that they want to be great. Yeah, and all what you've just described, all that creates a fantastic experience. And that's the experience makes us want more, makes us stay, makes us loyal. You know, we are, you know, we, we are creatures of experience. We love stories. We connect uh, with stories. That's why uh, storytelling within brands is so key. And we want the experience. And also we want ourselves, we want to know that this is doing better within the local community. You know, whether it's a small business, it's doing better within the local community. It's, It's maybe supporting a local school or whatever it might be, you know, or it's supporting food banks. But they are... They're helping to shift the needle. And all that creates that experience. Experience is so important for business. That was very well said because you're absolutely right. That's what it channels into. It's that connection and experience you have with it and why you feel good supporting that brand again and again and again. And I, I have a couple of businesses. There's one called Hired Jeans. I buy all my jeans from them. And I feel great even though I pay will pay more than I will pay anywhere else because I know every penny of that goes in the right place. Uh, and it makes me be part of that story. And I can learn from that. So uh, what about uh, you uh, being on this journey and you, you're talking about something, you know, you're trying to, you know, take the banner for a very difficult thing and trying to put it on the agenda and actually also with the businesses you work with, where do you get your uh, influence from and energy you need to to move ahead with this? Because it takes a lot of energy to 
you know, be an educator and a facilitator of such so big subjects as you're talking about in the books? I think I've I've been uh, privileged in the sense that I guest lecture at Coventry University and I am engaged with the next generation and I see them and I learn a lot from them. So that keeps me passionate and motivated. Uh, I have a, uh, we have a son. Um, I think about his future and, you know, the, the world I have played a role in and been part of the problem I've, you know, I've created. I'm not saying, you know, my, I have been part of this problem and, and, you know, what am I doing now to try and fix it? Um, and I think it's been very much part of my my upbringing that constantly motivates me. Um, you know, when I was growing up, when I was 16, my mum, we were living in India and at that time my mum in, involved me in um, the local hospital, the lo- working in the local hospital and seeing some of the the most poorest most vulnerable people um that you could possibly think of working in working with leprosy patients that I was afraid to even look at but all these things I think they shape you they've given me that experience so um yeah I I want things to be better than they are and that motivates me and when you said, you know, not every, I know not every every client that comes to me is right for me. Um, so I choose my clients that I know I can deliver on and clients that I can work authentically with. And that motivates me. Um, I'm being just curious, you know, curious about the world, learning. Um, and that's been the privilege of this book. You know, I've been able to cr- have conversations with people like yourself. That motivates me. There are other people out there trying to create change and shift the needle uh the book has been a privilege interviewing the different people for the book i was able to interview david katz who is the ceo of co-founder of plastic bank and david is one of he's considered one of the world's biggest change makers right now and just speaking to him was incredible i spoke to some also i spoke to uh another entrepreneur uh, CEO called James Quinn uh, and when I got off the con- you know the call from James I just felt thank this is why I'm writing the book because there are CEOs like that who are making change in the world so that all inspires me and and the book has just been um, has been a privilege because it's allowed these conversations that's that's super super interesting. And how, how do you then keep yourself going every day? How do you have the energy to push push ahead and continue as such? You know, because as you said, still looks very bleak and there's not much change. How do you get the energy to go and continue doing that and still do your work, lecture, and so on? Because that demands a lot of energy. Even you know, you're running your own business on top of that. Yeah, um, I think. You know, what this pandemic has done, it's helped us all reset. And I've always had, um, I've always wanted to make a change or try and play a part in something and and do something good. Uh, So I believe in the, there is now something called the economy of kindness and empathy. And I I want to play that role and, um, and be a, you know, a small piece in that. So you have to be part of it you you know there's also this thing you know people always say to me oh we don't listen to the news uh because it's so depressing we don't want to know what's going on and I always say to them how do you know what you needs to change if you're not listening to the news how can you change anything so I think that's always been a driver I've always wanted to somehow make things better um reading helps motivates me um reading just helps motivate me and just knowing that there are people out there who are less fortunate and um who's who's championing for them you know who is sort of speaking up for them so that that and the you know the other thing i could say is you know you look since this pandemic i've noticed all the birds in the garden i didn't even know there were so many different kinds of birds that existed all these little things you know just make the world better and without them, we would be nothing. And, and there was also something I've read. You know, bees disappeared from our planet. 
we as a as a species we would disappear within five years if we disappeared from the planet this planet would be thriving right and so that is my motivation that is it just right there yeah and that's very spot on because i think yeah people don't know about bees they should uh, just google uh, the impact bees has on our, our planet and then uh, you'll find out why it's so important that we protect bees because actually that, that, uh, that's one of the things we really can change and rapidly could change is that we actually create better you know natural environment for bees it's, like, it's one of my things actually I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I can support that because I know that's one of the, the silver bullets one of them there's a couple that needs to be solved but one of them as well if you were uh, should leave leaders out there with three advice, we have talked a lot. You're already given a lot of advice, a lot of thought, but like your top three advice to leaders out there, um, how they can get maybe started or accelerated uh, this kind of you know making impact. Let's call that and actually put that as part of their business. What would that be? I would there are there are. I would start with actually if you're about to start or you're established. Go back and look at your brand, understand the purpose of your brand, then understand the story you want to tell and how you want to communicate it. And then who is your customer, your client? Who do you want to sell to? That's really important. That would be the one of the key things. Um, the other would be keep it simple. You know, don't make anything complicated. If you're, you know, you should have corporate social responsibility at the heart of your brand. Don't make that complicated. Don't have more than four things, or even if it's one thing, make it one that you know you can deliver on. And then the third thing would be is always trust your instincts. Your instincts are your best tool in business. You know when something doesn't seem right, it seems off. If it's if it has that feeling, don't do it. And I think, you know, our instincts in business is key. So yeah, so those would be the three. Keep it simple, trust your instincts, and understand your brand. Great, great advice. And I like the one, uh, keep it simple, because then you can really start moving something. And if you start too many things, you're not moving anything. I think that's one of the biggest challenges for any business owner, exactly, to 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 say, this is the thing I'm going to do, wherever it's a commercial thing, or whatever, do one thing well at a time, I say, and then you move on when that works, and it's in the system for that. Where, where can people find you, uh, Sangeeta, if they want to, to know more about you, the book, and, and so on? What, what are the best places to go? Well, I live on Twitter. So um, so it's my name, Sangeeta Waldron. So it's Sangeeta, S-A-N-G-E-T-A, Waldron, W-A-L-D-R-O-N. So you, my name, um, so you, I operate with the same name on Twitter, LinkedIn. Find, you know, please connect with me there. Or my website, which is, uh, www.serendipitypr.co.uk and my book is on Amazon so yeah so just Google is our friend you can Google everything these days and you'll just pop up so um, yeah uh, we we will get everything put in the, the show notes for people as well so, so they can find you if you're out there and, and check things out thank you so much for, for spending your valuable time here today and, and sharing your insights and wisdom about how we can make the world a better place through business and storytelling it's been a privilege thank you so much sankita for your super advice and insights on how brands can make more positive impact on people communities and the planet we are at a tipping point we concluded but we have the power to change it so if you want to learn more about how to build a brand that makes positive impact you should also check out episode number 50 time for a system change with zoe henderson if you enjoyed today's conversation please share rate review or subscribe to one of our channels together with biz simply we are right now conducting a survey with the aim to collect best practice on how leaders in the industry are transforming their organization so they can deliver the experience both employees and customer are demanding please participate via the link in the show notes a big thank you to Biz Simply for supporting us, bringing you great insights, strategies, and tools to help the industry thrive, not just survive. Check them out at bizsimply.com or on their social at bizsimply or bizsimplyhq. You can also email them directly on advice at bizsimply.com. 
A big thank you to Fina Charlton, who is the show producer and editor from the Podcast Collective. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to the community and download free leadership tools at hospitalitymavericks.com. And don't worry, if you didn't get all of this, there will be links in the show notes. Thank you and be maverick.